Very well. Good, good, uh, good afternoon, uh, and welcome to the uh, European Roundtable on Climate Change and Sustainable Transition, a long name international town hall on CDAM. So if this is what you're looking for, this is the right place. We are uh, waiting for people to stream in. It will take a few times. Uh, the, the speakers are all here. One which seems to be slightly late, but I'm sure he will emerge. Uh, maybe Sarah, maybe you can send him an email and, and, and check what it is. Maybe he's missing a link. I mean, these things do happen sometimes. But uh, let's wait for a few minutes. I think there are a few hundred people that are supposed to be listed. We have a rule of thumb in ERCST as to the number of people that show up on the same time. It's always a running bet whether that, that average holds. So let's wait for uh, for a few minutes. But meanwhile, what I would like to, to do, I think in order to uh, uh, not to uh, if you spend the time of the of the meeting because we it is quite a tight schedule as it is uh, we have excellent speakers and we think it's a good program but uh, uh, so the the purpose of this is uh, uh, the national town hall we uh, at the RCSD have been uh, working on uh, CBAB now I think this is the fourth year so that the team of Michael, Michael Mailing, Aaron Cosby, Sarah Svensson now, and myself uh, at ERC have been working on this. We uh, we had shown interest in, in, in CBAM and border adjustment before it became, if you want, something that was a la mode and maybe accepted in Brussels. And uh, when this thing, when I actually became an item in Brussels, I think in a way we're primed and it was very fortunate that we're actually ready to have a conversation on this, then everybody went to lockdown and the rest of history. Uh, so we have been working quite a lot. And uh, one of the things that we do, we punctuate every year, the program that we do with an international town hall, we have always aimed at the RCSD to be not only present in Brussels in Europe, but to the uh, degree of our abilities and, and, and modest capabilities, try to tap into uh, the global bubble of climate change policy. In the end, Europe is not isolated. Europe is functioning in a, in a global framework, whether it's, it is mainly under the framework convention on climate change in the Paris Agreement, but also in the context of a number of other uh, events and conferences that uh, and meetings that are setting up agenda where the Clean Energy Ministerial, the G20, there are a number of other elements that feed into this policy debate in the EU and that EU policy response to it. Um, as you will know, uh, the, the program today is focused on a update or where we are on the, uh, on the CBAM. We do have quite a strong contingent on non-Europeans. I think that uh, based on the reports that we get from, from Michael, it was in, in up in New York State and Aaron in somewhere in Western Canada, but other friends and colleagues, there's quite a lot of knowledge in many cases, uh, quite detailed knowledge of what's happening in Europe with respect to CBAM and its uh, implementing acts. But nevertheless, we felt compelled to start the first panel and talk about an update. Um, what is this? Where are we on CBAM and the remaining legislation gaps? The devil is sometimes in the details, and uh, it is not the first time where the impact of the regulation has been quite substantial on the legislation itself. Uh, I, you know, we have all been in this in this world for a long time. So this is the first part where where Mike and and myself will be giving you a quick update for the, the benefit that of trying to level the playing field, so to speak. It's, it's a pun on, on, on CBAM, but okay, fine. And, uh, and then the second part, the intention is that it's called process and compliance operationalization. Operationalizing CBAM is very much the intention to talk about how entities, uh, whether exporters, importers, regulators, advisors are preparing themselves and their clients in some cases for the uh, upcoming uh, opening ceremony, which will be at the end of this year, towards the end of this year. 
So this is where uh, you have Ioannis Zakharidis from Gigi Taksu. Ioannis, welcome, and it's good, good to have you here. Uh, Aaron Cosby, uh, that, which I, I have mentioned, that senior fellow at the ADRCSD. He has been quite well known in this field for, for decades now and works was also with others such as IASD quite, quite closely. Tim Figueres from Amcham, well, welcome Tim. And, and last but not least, Yves Melan from Reed Smith. Um, and good to see you, Eve. Thank you very much for taking the time. I, I, I know that you guys charge by the minute, so I know this, 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 is, this is time is money for lawyers. Uh, the third session is, is monitoring and reporting and his intention to, uh, to talk about the implementing act that is now under consideration. And uh, we will have here Huber Palman from the Environmental Agency in Austria, Emmanuel Breton, uh, Brutin from same bureau, Daniele Perigotti, Pernigotti uh, from Aquilibria, and uh, we have also a guest from POSCO, which is a, uh, a, a Korean steel manufacturer who is doing business and exporting to the EU. Uh, I assume he will be joining us. I'm not sure what's detaining him, but we're making every effort to track him down, whether in Brussels or in Korea, and he has no chance of escaping. So we will find him eventually, but for the moment. So this is where uh, the program for today, uh, I think, a few people have come on the on the uh, on the uh, virtual meeting, and I my sense is that we should get going, Michael, and uh, step into the first discussion, which is CBAM and remaining legislation and gaps. So again, for many of you, it may be old hat, but it is an international town hall, and I think it will be an opportunity maybe for some to get up to date. We will making this presentation uh, available uh, later after the meeting. And then we'll ask permission for those of you that are on the call to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to share the presentations and we will not do so without your, your permission. Now, um, I will now make a, a valiant attempt of sharing the screen. If it doesn't work, don't get horribly alarmed because it should work after all these years. There you go, it does work. Okay, so uh, Mike and I will do this. I will, I will do a couple of first slides and, and Michael will then move on to do uh, the, the last two slides. So in terms of the, uh, the presentation and, and where we are on this, the... Uh, Oops, sorry, I'm not sure what's happening. Okay. The timeline, I think it's well known to you. We are now at the point where the, <clears throat> the, uh, there's an agreement, there's a directive, and there's a, there are a number of, of implementing acts that are, are, are coming down the pipe, but essentially the more important part that we are in the transition period beginning in 2023, at the end of 2023, this is transition period, as you well know, is a reporting period for emission uh, at this time. So October 1, 2023, is, this is starting. The game starts, I think that everybody's kind of waiting with some level of anxiety when we start something new, which is demanding. It is not uh, easy. There's, a, you know, as you will see, there's a lot of flexibility built in the system, but nevertheless is something new. It is, as we, we know, initially narrow scope linked to basic materials, cement and clay, fertilizer, iron, steel, aluminum, electricity, hydrogen, and certain upstream precursor. Mm -hmm. January 1, 2026 starts the, uh, the payment obligation. And that payment it gradually phases in with uh, the percentages that you see there, and I don't want to do that. There's going to be also a number of reviews in 2026, 2028, and then uh, a possibility of expanding the COPE with additional products for the precursor and downstream screens in 2030. So this is kind of the timeline that we are. I think this timeline is, is well known, but for the record, I think it's, it's useful and helpful to remind everybody exactly how this thing is unfolding. 
Now, there are a number of implementing acts that are, are coming up and some, you know, the, it is Q, the, the, the quarter of the year, Q2, 23, 24, 25. So there's a whole bunch of implementing acts uh, implementing acts coming down the pipe. I'm not going to go to this, to all of them, because I still don't think it's helpful. But really, uh, they are setting up, I would, some would call the nitty gritty, and some of them would call really explaining <clears throat> how people will do this and what is involved. And there are, to expect, or you will see today from the discussion that there can be some enormous differences. Uh, in terms of how this is going to work. Uh, now, if you're on the first one, we, we have referred to information to be reported as part of reporting obligation for importers of importing goods. Then you have process of verification of the emission, process and produce of registry of sale of CBIM certificates. So all kinds of, of items that are important and that will make things about geographical circumventions through artificial islands, format and some element of the CDAM declaration. So very, 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 very precise stuff that, you know, some people have questions, but will surprise many. And then you have delegated act conditions of granting uh, or accreditation for verifier, uh, the sale of CDAM certificates and the further definition of timing administration as aspects, the possibility of, of amending the list of countries possibility and, 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 and then on, on circumvention to slightly modify goods to make those goods fall outside Annex 1. So quite a few uh, also important things that will make a difference of how this is put in application. Again, we have a, a, a legislation. These are the This is the regulation that makes a difference. Michael, you, you go now. All right. Thank you, Andre. And looking at the audience, I, I noticed, as, as you predicted, and it's a very international mix, a lot of Eastern Europe, Central Asia, even Far East. So I think it's worth looking at the content of the regulation. Um, Andre, you jumped back, I think, a slide. So <clears throat> this is essentially a snapshot of what the final regulation, regulation 2023-956, which entered into force on May 17th after being published in the official journal, sets out, you know, at the sort of overarching level for the CBAM. And I think it's important to, to note that this is really the final act of legislation. Over the last 12 plus months, I don't want to know how many times in international press, for instance, here in the US, I heard Ah, the parliament voted, it's adopted, or the council has voted, now it's adopted, a provisional compromise, then parliament voted in the in the subsequent process formally, and then it said each time there was confusion, is it adopted, is it not? Well, with the formal votes then and signature and uh, publication in the official journal, it's now really final, this is the legislative act, this is the regulation, and it will apply, and the timeline that Andre then mentioned it shows that there's a backloaded process of adding implementing acts and delegated acts, which operationalize many details, but the sort of fundamental architecture and the basic principles and the basic obligations of reporting declarants, et cetera, they're set out in this regulation. What does it contain? So to very briefly sort of skip through it, Andre already showed the timeline with this kind of backloaded process of phasing out free allocation at which where simultaneously the payment obligations for importers then phase in. So it's really sort of backloaded. And then, of course, preceded by this transitional period, which is reporting only for which we now have a draft implementing regulation, which we'll discuss in the session today. Um, and along with that, free, with that timeline and, and phasing out of free allocation, you can see sort of these percentages. Andre also mentioned that. Um, what is the adjustment level? So what do importers actually have to do? What is their obligation, if you like, the most substantive one? Of course, there's the reporting and all those sort of, if you like, um, um, ancillary obligations, but the core is really to make importers pay a carbon price for products, covered products that is commensurate to the carbon price paid by domestic producers under the EUTS. Now, it doesn't mean that they buy allowances under the EUTS. No, the regulation sets up a separate system of certificates which importers have to purchase, but those certificates will track the price, the average closing price in um, auctions in the primary market for allowances. They're not tradable. There's some ability to sell them back to uh, member states, but by and large, you know, these are really just for compliance with the CBAM. It's not going to create a market. 
We know that all countries are covered. There's no exemption, say, for least developed countries. Um, there's only one exemption, and it's sort of functionally justified and logical. The countries that have a linked ETS, uh, such as Switzerland with the EU ETS, the carbon price is converging. It's, it's essentially the same, so there make, it makes no sense to, to have a CBAM since there is no difference in carbon pricing. And then for historical reasons, certain small EU territories abroad, essentially islands, et cetera. Sectors, um, we always knew from since the proposal in July 2021, it's cement, fertilizer, steel, aluminum, and electricity. And with the votes in the provisional compromise last December, um, hydrogen was added, and that's now also part of the um, regulation. One um, distinction to bear in mind, though, there's now two annexes listing products and the second annex specifies that only cement and fertilizers will also be complying for indirect emissions from electricity generated on site or imported, you know, purchased on the grid, et cetera, from off site. Um, that can then change over time, but for now, at least in the regulation, only these two goods also are accountable for indirect emissions. It only covers imports. There was much discussion about whether exports should also uh, receive some kind of rebate or um, other form of, of um, you know, alleviation but that has been postponed for now. There's only going to be a review in 2028 whether there is export related leakage concerns and that should be changed. The determination of embedded emissions is at the core of much what, of what we'll discuss today and also of the draft implementing regulation that we will discuss. Um, and um, article seven, um, eight and, and annex um, four, I think it is now since it was pushed back, specifies sort of the basic principles in the regulation. We know that the starting point is always actual emissions for direct emissions, at least reported and verified by the importers. And then if that's not possible, if there's no data being provided um, for capacity reasons or because they're withholding it, then there are fallbacks um, that have yet to be fully specified, but they will be less favorable based on averages, or in one case, even as a second fallback, the worst performing EU producers. For indirect emissions, there will be more default values, but again, that's something that's not quite relevant yet. Um, that really starts later. Um, and it, as I mentioned, it only starts for, for a subset of covered products as well. Crediting of foreign policies under Article 9 of the regulation, only explicit carbon pricing is the understanding, and that has to be documented uh, by the declarant and verified. So only carbon taxes, emissions trading systems, or some other form of really sort of traditional textbook style of carbon price. Revenue will be accruing to the general budget of the EU, but there has been sort of a political announcement that the EU would strive to make a uh, amount of support available for developing countries to help them achieve capacity, implement monitoring, reporting, and verification systems, et cetera, to help them comply with the CBAM obligations. And finally, on the institutional aspects and how it is internally governed, I think that's probably of less interest for the, for the audiences abroad, since that's not really affecting their compliance that much. Shall we go to the next slide to quickly look also at the compliance cycle? So the timeline, it, in many ways, if you're familiar with the EU ETS, or in fact, with most emissions trading systems around the world, you will recognize a similar sort of process. Of course, declarants, importers have to first uh, apply for authorization in order to even be allowed to import covered products that are listed in annexes one and two. But um, once they've done that, they face an annual sort of compliance cycle by May 31st every year. They have to declare the embedded emissions in goods. This is after the transitional period. The transitional period is a bit different. And I think we'll, we'll hear more about that shortly for the first um, three years. But after 2026, um, it is um, an annual process. So by May 31st, declaring the embedded emissions, those have to already have been verified by an independent accredited verifier. And, and the surrender certificates happens at the same time through the CBAM registry. So essentially complying with this payment obligation to make sure that imported products, the embedded carbon is priced just like EU products. I think I'll not add more to this. And if I'm not mistaken, we can jump into the, to the real discussion now with this update on where we stand. What do you mean? You mean like I, I didn't participate in the real discussion? Come on. Uh, <laughs> we were we were narrating, Andre, narrating known facts. <laughs> no, we are we are narrating known facts, and I think that it's uh, yes. But we felt that we could we should be taking, and I'm looking at 20 minutes. Actually, it's, it's a little bit just about right because wanted we wanted to bring people up to speed. And on the other hand, I'm not going to open uh, this uh, for. Uh, 
uh, uh, open for questions. I would, uh, there, there's a Q&A here, but what I would very much uh, encourage people to raise their hand when we start uh, at the end of the next panel in order to be asked questions as opposed to asking and getting written answers. Written answer, you can write an email. The purpose of these nice people taking time and being here, maybe not live, but in uh, virtual is that we try to have an interactive uh, conversation and be able, you know, back and forth. So let's go now to, as Michael was saying, the, the real games, the uh, process of compliance and virtualization of, of CBAM. And Ioannis Zakaridis, you are first. Uh, so Yanis, again, thank you very much. Taxud, DJ Taxud, which we didn't know before this started, has been, if nothing else, very cooperative. And we have always appreciated uh, yourself and, and, and Vicente and, and, and uh, Director General Gerasimus Thomas. Thank you, Ioannis. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks for inviting me. Um, so I, um, I've i sort of uh, organized uh, the, the, my intervention into three areas uh, to speak about uh, the work we're doing on the CBOM for the transitional period uh, that will start from October. The first is to give a first uh, a short overview of where we stand with the Implementing Act and the general preparatory work that we're doing to facilitate implementation from the autumn. Secondly, I'll touch on, I'll reflect a bit on the um, on the principles of our thinking for the transitional period and how that has sort of fed into the the approach for the design of the mechanism for uh, for the first two years. For um, and um, and third, I will I will touch um, on some of the main implementation modalities and the systems that will support the reporting. So. To, to start, I um, on the draft implementing regulation, as you know, this has been published for uh, for consultation um, in, in, in mid-June. Uh, the open public consultation is still ongoing and it, it will run until the 11th of July. In the run-up to the preparation of this uh, implementing act, we've been consulting quite extensively with different stakeholders, uh, uh, both in the EU, but also in third countries through um, uh, the uh, our informal expert working group, but also uh, outside of that. Uh, um, but as you know, the uh, ERCST is also an observer to our to our group um, um, and has been following discussion. So at the moment, we are receiving comments through the open public consultation, and we are also discussing with the with the member states, with the EU member states, through the formal CMAM committee that has been set up. Which is a, it's a formal organ to to approve the. Uh, um, the the implementing acts um, and um, and this means that the text is in in in, in a way evolving uh, from what has been published. We are looking into the text. We're looking into different comments. Our aim is to try to consolidate all the comments in order to get uh, the text approved and adopted uh, um, within uh, before the end of the summer, essentially. Now, in the in the meantime, we are also preparing dedicated trainings that will support implementation from the autumn. There will be various e-learnings, which will be sector specific, um, uh, but also general. Um, the aim there is to define the reporting roles, the requirements, and what needs to be monitored, reported, etc. We can't do that. However, we can't launch any of those before the text is the final text is 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 stable and adopted essentially. Um, and there will also be various uh, webinars uh, on, on the implementation modalities and the reporting from September. There will also be a, a dedicated website with everything will be, all the information will be gathered there, including the guidance documents, including templates for reporting, uh, for communication of information between the, the, the producers of the goods and, and the reporting declarants in the EU, and there will be specialized Q&A. So that's just a, a brief overview of where we stand. Now, Coming to the Implementing Act itself, the, it is important to emphasize that the, the main guiding principle in the design of the transitional period has always been and still is that it is a learning phase for all. And by this, we mean that it's a learning phase uh, uh, for the reporting declarants in the EU, for the third country uh, operators of the installations, for the member states authorities, but of course for us, for the Commission. And, and, and therefore, the, the transitional period aims for all actors to understand the respective roles and their tasks. The commission to collect the necessary information in order to improve the functioning of the system and also for the system to, to get ready to be uh, for a smooth rollout after 2025 uh, when there is a financial obligation essentially. 
So in this respect, the information that we'll be collecting will help us first to specify and finalize the methodology for the reporting and re for, the, for the monitoring and reporting of, of, of the emissions. And of course, the verification of the emissions, which is uh, uh, coming into, into play from 2026. In the first two years, there's no, there is no requirement as such for verification. Um, and, and, and the intention is that, the, the we, that we make use of the information that we collect in order to find synergies where possible with existing monitoring and reporting schemes uh, in, in, in partner countries. And secondly, this information will help us uh, to, uh, to deliver on what we've been mandated to do by 2025, the commission that is, uh, and that is to review the mechanism and see whether it can be expanded in new sectors, uh, to see how we address in, uh, uh, indirect emissions, et cetera, the, 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 the points that you, you've already mentioned in your, in your introduction. So reflecting all this, the design of the transitional period has been such in order to allow a number of flexibilities. And these flexibilities are essentially there to facilitate reporting because of the tight time frame and to facilitate the reporting in the beginning and to introduce a certain degree of openness. And uh, essentially it aims to balance smooth introduction, but also help us meet our information needs as well. So from a, there will be a number of points that will be raised and I know in, in the next uh, section, in the next uh, session on, 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 the, on the monitoring rules and the calculation rules uh, and there uh, other, other types of flexibilities will also be touched upon. But I want to talk about some of the flexibility from a reporting perspectives, from a, a reporting perspective. <clears throat> the first one being the possibility to report emissions on the basis of rules other than those listed in the annex of the implementing regulation. We're laying out a number of rules in the implementing regulation, which are essentially the commission rules. Um, uh, uh, but until uh, for the first year, until uh, the first 31st of December of 2024, um, it is possible to use an alternative, uh, an alternative uh, methodology, alternative monitoring rules. Um, and this could be either based on a carbon pricing scheme where the installation is located, or based on a compulsory emissions monitoring scheme where the installation is located, or an emissions monitoring scheme at the installation, if that is, uh, which can be covered by, uh, by, by verification uh, uh, by an accredited verifier. Now, the, the main condition here is that alternative rules can be used, but they should lead to a similar coverage and accuracy of emissions data compared to those methods that we lay out in, in, in the annexes. And, and the time limit is also important here. Um, from 20, from essentially from January 2025, only the, the rules laid out in the annexes uh, uh, can be used. Then uh, there is um, a possibility to use um, um, uh, um, default values or um, uh, other methods, essentially, uh, uh, for the first three quarters, uh, for the first three uh, reporting quarters. And, and these other methods essentially mean uh, either uh, the preliminary default values that the commission will, be pu will publish uh, uh, for, the, for the transitional period or any other set of, of the default value. Then there are um, extra flex flexibilities for the, for the modification of the reports. Um, a report can be modified uh, every um, uh, at least two months after uh, uh, the reported quarter, and for the first uh, two CBAM reports, it is possible to uh, uh, to modify them um, with a deadline um, uh, of um, uh, and, until sorry until uh, July 2024. Now, uh, moving on to the um, um, uh, to some of the reporting modalities and keeping in mind these flexibilities. Allow me to say a few words on how the, the reporting will be done uh, from October 2023. So the reporting is the responsibility of the reporting declarant, which is essentially the importer or a person that has the, the authorization to launch, to lodge, sorry, um, a, a customs uh, declaration, or indeed an, an indirect customs representative when the importer is established outside the union or or whether there is, uh, there is an agreement uh, uh, by, by the importer. Now, um, the reports are to be submitted on a quarterly basis. You've mentioned that already, and they're due uh, one month after the end of this quarter. 
the critical bit, so obviously, is that the declarants do not have the information themselves. So um, the information can only come from the operator of the installation. And um, in, in the annexes of the Implementing Act, it is indicated that the information needs to be communicated between the two. But how this information is communicated, is to, be, is to be communicated within the two, is done to their bilateral relationship. What we can do and what we try to do in the Implementing Act is to facilitate the information exchange and make sure that what is communicated is um, uh, um, um, what is, will be required essentially by the reporting declarant in order to, to meet their uh, uh, reporting obligations. And for this reason, we are putting together a template in an Excel uh, uh, format, which will um, essentially be built in such a way to allow for um, uh, uh, the, 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 the imputing of the, of the, of the different uh, data that needs to be monitored, all the formula, all, all the formulas that um, uh, are reflected in the annex will be embedded in, the, in that Excel, in the Excel template. So the calculations will, uh, uh, will be facilitated and there will be a final um, um, a set of results that can be and either the full template or the final set of results uh, can be uh, communicated between between the two. Our our uh, what we can do is recommend this uh, the use of this template in order to have um, uh, the fuller uh, uh, um, exchange of, of 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 information. And what needs to be reported during the transitional period, as I say, there is no uh, verification. Uh, what needs to be reported essentially is the the quality. Uh, the, sorry, the quant information about the goods. Essentially, the quantity of the goods that have been imported by CN code identified essentially by their, uh, um, yeah, by the same code at a digit, the country of origin, um, information about the installation, uh, company name, uh, uh, its location, its uh, geographic coordinates, etc. information about uh, the, the production of the good, uh, the, the production routes, and certain qualifying parameters that will allow us to understand and assess uh, the, the quality of the data. And of course, information about the emissions, the specific direct and the specific and, and, and the indirect emissions. We are also asking information about the carbon price that has been paid uh, uh, at the production country, but also information about the carbon price should that carbon price has been paid on the precursors of the goods, the inputs of the goods. If, if that is, um, uh, whether that has been subject to carbon price in the same country or these precursors come from a, a third country. And, and finally, how are the reports to be submitted? Um, we are designing a, um, a registry, which is essentially the basis for the actual registry of CBAM that will run from 2026. This is essentially the transitional registry that will run now from October uh, up until the, the end of 2025. And this is essentially an IT interface where the reporting declarants uh, will provide the information needed in order to fulfill their uh, uh, reporting obligations. Um, if the reporting declarants have already the importance or have already um, an AORI number, they can easily gain access by um, requesting a, a login to this uh, uh, registry uh, uh, via the portal. So um, I think with that, I'm, I'm, I've tried to cover most of the general and some of the specific elements from the implementing act. I'll, I'll stop there and pass the floor to the other uh, uh, colleagues, and then we can come back to issues on the specific issues of Q&A. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks, uh, Ioannis. I think that what, what will happen is we try very hard to separate panels. In, in the end, there will be obviously overlap between what is what is being said, and, and you know, uh, Hubert will also covers uh, quite a, a few of the uh, very pertinent uh, kind of few details of, of what is in the, in the app. Uh, what I have to say is that also ERCSD has produced a paper, a sh short uh, analysis of, of what is in the, in the draft implementing act. Uh, Michael and Aaron and, and, and Sarah who's here with, with us and, and myself that has been released earlier today. Uh, Sarah, if you want to put it on the chat, the link, I think that'd be good. And, and it is available on our website. Aaron, you are up next to that. Thanks, Andre. So I think you can see the screen that I've just shared. 
I'm going to try to run through just some of the high level points in the report that you just mentioned. Some of this, it, well, all of this builds if almost directly. If you can directly. go into the presentation mode, maybe uh, that'd, be, uh, that'd be good. I like that. There we go. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so all of this builds almost directly on uh, the, the excellent foundation that uh, Ioannis has given us uh, in understanding what the, the rules will be during the transition period. Uh, so we go through some of the strengths of the approach that the Commission has uh, put forward, as well as some of the concerns that are raised by what the uh, impl draft implementing regulation uh, gives us. So to start with the strengths, always start with the positive. Uh, the, a key strength is that the approach outlined in that draft implementing regu regulation closely mirrors what is required of domestic producers under the ETS. Um, and so, for example, we have uh, there's a clear mapping of the, the CN codes that are used uh, for the EU ETS reporting uh, to the covered sectors. Um, the, the specification of system boundaries for direct emissions are, are pretty much more or less in line with the EU ETS rules under the monitoring and reporting regulation. Um, this is a good thing uh, because for, for a couple of reasons. First, under trade law, this regulate the CBAM itself is supposed to be a mirroring of the internal requirements at the border. It's supposed to be a regulation that, with application at the border that exactly mirrors the internal requirements. So that's good. It's also good in that politically, you don't want to, uh, uh, to give rise to suspicion that you have imposed a more onerous set of requirements on importers. That is not good for diplomacy or, or for that matter, it's not good for your uh, chances of uh, having the thing challenged under trade law. There is, of course, a tension between exact mirroring and the objective of presenting, preventing leakage that uh, is the key objective of the CBAM. For example, uh, you know, EU producers are not subject to a requirement to buy uh, uh, EU allowances for their precursors, the embedded emissions in their precursors, or for electricity for that matter. There's a reason that they are required under the CBAM uh, because those the, the EU producers eventually pay for that anyway if the, there's a cost pass through, but there is not an exact mirroring, uh, and there is that tension between the need to exactly mirror and the objective of preventing leakage. The second positive element we found in the uh, uh, draft implementing regulation is a pragmatic flexibility, and, and Ioannis described a number of the elements of that flexibility. Uh, declarants that are subject to existing reporting requirements in their home countries can use a wide variety of methods to calculate and, and report their embedded direct emissions up until the end of 2024. Uh, if, if there's no requisite data, then they can use any other unspecified method, you know, as long as it comports with the, 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 the final results uh, uh, that would be uh, obtained by EU methods until 31st of July, 2024. This is just a, a, a pragmatic recognition that there's a short timeline that importers, uh, that producers are going to have to meet in order to start complying with these regulations. And so this is a welcome thing. And finally, uh, positive is, uh, as you has said, this is explicitly uh, adopting a learning approach. The, the transition period is aimed at trying to find information data which will inform the decisions about the final obligations importers and producers will have to meet in the definitive period. Uh, you know, so so, for example, the uh, the reporting on embedded indirect emissions uh, is explicitly flexible in order to provide data that's going to allow the commission to eventually choose among the three possible options for defaults on indirect emissions that are set out in the CBAM. Uh, legislation. Let me move then to some of the concerns with the draft implementing regulation. Those very flexibilities, which are a strength of the uh, transition period, are potentially a concern. There's a need to strike a balance here. If they are too permission, if they are too permissive, they will lead to a, a widespread reporting of poor or inexact data. We will, uh, in, in other words, potentially have reporters under-reporting their actual emissions. This involves a risk that we will have an underestimation of the risk of leakage. Uh, and the risk of leakage underlies a number of the important decisions for final reporting obligations that are going to be made uh, for the definitive period, um, including whether or not to include indirect emissions for other sectors. So that balance is important. 
the the flexibilities are important, but they can't be so uh, so striking as to lead to a, a lack of important information. Similarly, the the verification in the transition period in the implementing regulation, it says that the council uh, may check CBAM reports for compliance. In practice, if that means that the uh, check on compliance is too infrequent, we have a lack of accurate data on which to base those final rules in the definitive period, and this may be a challenge. Um, there is a welcome bubble approach. Uh, in other words, it's a recognition, a pragmatic recognition of the fact that uh, production in sectors like steel, for example, take place in, in vertical facilities where there are a number of covered processes. Um, and it allows those producers to, for example, uh, report uh, their integrated emissions on an average facility basis, even though there are several uh, covered processes involved. Uh, we just get the, the final average emissions that cover all those processes. This is a nice thing if you're an integrated producer. However, it does result in a lack of usable data uh, on the individual processes that are covered under the CBAM. And so there, there again, we need to be careful of the balance that's struck between the need to be pragmatic and allow facilit facilitate compliance and the need for useful data that will inform the final regulations in the definitive period. Uh, two more concerns. One is the need for capacity. Uh, we noted the need to have careful verification to uh, to ensure that proper information was coming in to inform the final regulations. That will involve a great deal of increased capacity among the member states and in the commission. Uh, just just a, a red flag here that that's going to mean resources and a budget for those resources to allow that to take place. And a final concern, there is within the regulation uh, an assumption that scrap material, scrap and waste material inputs, um, for example, in the iron and steel production, aluminum production, can be assigned a zero value for embedded emissions. Now, it's true that uh, in the context of, for example, aluminum production, you have a 95% energy savings if you're using scrap as opposed to uh, primary production. But we can't assume that that primary production in foreign context actually paid a carbon price. So this this uh, exemption, if we have characterized the exemption correctly, uh, we stand to be corrected, is a, is a large loophole. It fails to level the playing field between uh, EU producers and foreign producers. It allows for incentives, for example, for foreign producers to vastly over-report their use of scrap, even if there has been no carbon price paid on it, and therefore enter the EU uh, with goods that pay a very low CBAM fee. And given that most of the emissions in those uh, uh, processes, particularly aluminum and also steel and iron, take place upstream, uh, if those emissions are assigned to zero value, that's a, that's a significant advantage and a risk of leakage. So a, a few concluding thoughts very quickly. Those flexibilities during the first years are going to help uh, foster a constructive engagement with trade partners and foreign producers, as we said, but there is a need to balance that with the, the overriding need for collecting good data on which to base the final regulations uh, that will start in uh, 2026. So, uh, but so some remaining concerns that we highlighted in our analysis, um, but but overall, we think that the proposal strikes a, a good balance between the need for flexibility and the need for uh, 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 good data to underlie those final regulations. Um, there is, of course, a, a steep learning curve for some exporters, and especially those that are not currently subject to any kind of reporting requirements. Um, and there, this means, of course, there is a, a commensurate need for the EU to engage in capacity building and uh, support those producers in coming up to speed and compliance. Going forward, we the, the worst case scenario is that this standard is uh, accompanied by a number of other standards at the international level, either for other CBAMs or for green procurement uh, uh, requirements or, or other, uh, other uh, international agreements. Uh, or private sector requirements that involve a different reporting protocol. Uh, so ideally, the EU's approach, as laid out in the draft implementing legislation, would have provided a, a sort of a pole around which international cooperation could uh, coalesce to offer us a single international standard to which producers and uh, importers could adhere. 
we don't really see that happening here. And in part, that's because the, uh, the, the requirements do have to cleave fairly closely to the ETS, but it means that ultimately we hope that the next step in the process from the commission will involve the kind of international cooperation that might lead to at least some sort of coales uh, coalescence around uh, uh, recognizable standards that, that adhere to international practice to make things easier for exporters. I'll leave it there. I'll stop sharing. I'm looking forward to the discussion that follows. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you, Aaron. And I have to tell you, you should have been a fly on the wall in our discussion on on the treatment of scrap because we had all kind of, of bizarre scenarios that we're imagining about ourselves. So that was quite a quite a strong and interesting uh, discussion. But again, emphasizing what what Aaron has said that by and large, on the on balance, life is not perfect and nothing is perfect. But the sense we have is that a, a good balance had be had be stricken between the uh between the flexibility and the need to ensure that the data that comes in is accurate and is helping the cause because that this is what it is for uh, and again the encouragement to the commission to keep that in mind when when the analysis is made that this there is there's a grain of salt to be involved in in this thank you very much aaron and then i'm going to tim and then eve so tim first I, I guess you, your phones might be ringing off the hook. Yes, on the it, side it, asking questions. It is. It is, and thank you. Great, great to be with you. I mean, both in my day job, uh, working on these issues at Boston Consulting Group with many of the clients globally that have to um, uh, deal with these uh, issues, but also working with AmCham EU's members, many of whom have got production both in the EU, but also outside the EU as they tend to be uh, global, global multinationals um, um, operating in this environment. And I think if we look at the kind of um, challenges that, that we've identified, many of them have, have been have been raised. And Yanis, you'll be pleased to know you've already answered one of the points that we'll put in our response to your consultation, which was that providing easily accessible information online for third country producers is going to be absolutely essential because we have significant numbers of, of, of producers right around the world who don't have familiarity with how the EU ETS works, who are going to have to get up to speed very quickly with what is a, a, a complex process, uh, and which is not very easy to work out just by reading the legal texts, exactly what you have to do. So very, very, very welcome that um, DG Taxid will provide lots of information and how-to guides um, on that. Secondly, there's also quite a significant um, burden on importers, including indirect customs representatives, which has come out a lot in our, our consultations with AmCham EU members. So a lot of logistics, customs agents and other people who are not used to implementing these environmental type regulations are going to be responsible for making the declarations and ensuring that they can get the necessary information from producers. And they probably need um, a bit of help and support in adapting their systems and processes and so forth for a, uh, for a new uh, environmental um, obligation that they're not used to implementing. And then I think the third thing is we've focused very much on the implementing regulation, but I notice also in, in, in uh, your report, uh, uh, Michael and uh, Aaron, you've, you've also quite rightly drawn attention to the uh, really important reports that the Commission is going to have to write during the uh, transitional period, setting the direction for what's going to happen next. First, precisely how the rules on 1 January 2026 will operate, but also in the medium term, how might the scope of the CBAM expand in terms of uh, more scopes of emissions, more complex products, 
even services and uh, transport um, on, you know, potentially on the table. And so if you are a global multinational thinking about the strategic implications of all of this, in particular, things like, you know, do I need to in invest in decarbon decarbonizing my production or do I need to think about my production footprint? You're thinking on a much longer time scale than just what do I need to do to be in compliance for the 1st of January 2026. So the sooner um, the, the Commission sets out its intended direction of travel and expectations for how CBAM will unfold through the rest of the decade and beyond, uh, the easier it will be for bigger firms to make decisions about the, the very significant uh, investments or other strategy choices they'll need to make uh, in order to respond to the regulation. Okay, uh, thanks, Tim. I think the uh, we we intended very much this this report to provide a a uh, first line of defense uh, and and inform people uh, and try to explain, make people understand a little bit some of the the questions that should be asking themselves and kind of wonder about certain things. But in the end, there is a lot more technical stuff, and this is not the intention of the RCST to to put out that kind of document. Uh, if you also are advising many many of your clients of at, at Reed Smith, uh, what are the things that preoccupy you? What do you hear from your your customers? Thank you, a, a few things. Um, so I, I'm um, for people who don't know me, I'm a customs lawyer, international trade lawyer uh, at core. So I come to CBAM with the uh, uh, thinking about how is this is going to be enforced. Uh, we've been hired uh, for the past eighteen months by clients uh, helping. Um, asking our help to think about how to comply, you know, how to comply, you need to know how this thing is going to work in practice. Um, I wanted to first to go back to a few basic concepts to help understand that the burden the CBAM is imposing, um, to understand that burden. Uh, what is a declarant? A declarant under customs law is an importer. So anyone importing CBAM goods that steel, aluminum, etc. Um, is subject to the CBAM regulation. In the transitional period, that is anybody. Anybody today who is importing CBAM goods is subject to the CBAM regulation and the transitional um, implementing regulation which will be published soon. Um, that means submitting a report in January 2024 with all sorts of detailed information. In the definitive period, there is, a, there is an authorization mechanism whereby only a selected number of producers, uh, uh, importers will be allowed to place CBAM goods on the EU market. Others could still do it, and I'm sure others will do it, but not lawfully, and that will have all sorts of implications. Um, what to expect in the authorization process? There are two scenarios. Either it's easy to be authorized, and then you have lots of importers, uh, or it's very difficult, in which case you only have a very limited number of importers or something in the middle. Both have issues. If you have only a limited number of importers, you are basically disrupting completely the way steel, aluminum, and other products are distributed today in, in, in Europe. On the other hand, if it's easy to become an importer, authorized declarant, then you have all sorts of people who have no idea about what we're talking about. That's the first basic thing I wanted to, to, to say. Second thing, um, CBAM is EU revenue. CBAM is EU revenue triggered by the crossing of the border. There is only one other sort of EU revenue of this type, it's custom duties. And when we see how custom duties are enforced, for instance, if you claim a preferential origin to pay less than the right amount of duties, there's a parallel here, you import goods and you want to pay less than the default value, CBAM value, you're asking for a break. Uh, we, we see how this is enforced, enforced, and this is sometimes not pretty, so very harshly. And you, people need to think about that. Mistakes will be costly. Then the third thing I wanted to say is uh, uh, how I discovered CBAM and what were my initial expectations. Until a month ago, I would tell clients, look, I know this is big. This is going to impose a lot of, of uh, requirements on you, but this is going to be gradual. So first, uh, October of 2023, a dry run, where uh, if you don't know, that's okay, because the, 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 the working assumption is that most people have no idea about the emissions embedded in what they are importing. And um, in October, I would say, don't worry, it's a dry run, you will be allowed to make mistakes. And then 1st of January 2026, you will have to pay 
uh, CBAM, uh, um, purchase CBAM certificates, but since they will be off, it will be offset by the allowances, free allowances that are out there, even if you don't know your carbon footprint, in 2026, the cost will be low, and so you have time to learn. Up June 2023, we see the implementing regulation, and what we see there is lots of information being required. And if you read there, penalties recommended by the Commission between 10 and 50 euro per ton of carbon. So it's more expensive than the actual emissions of carbon. So this is a completely <laughs> reassess what to tell our clients. Uh, take this seriously and run because the, 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 you have obligations on the 1st of October, which are very onerous on you. Then I'm going to give the, the point of view of our two, two categories of clients that we meet and advise. Uh, first, manufacturers of uh, CBAM goods outside of the EU. They have a number of concerns, some of them small, some of them large. The main concern they have is the confidentiality of their information. They say, how I make my steel and how my steel is green is my secret sauce. I do not share this picture Coca-Cola, the recipe for Coca-Cola. I do not share this with anybody. And what I'm required to give already on 1st of October is part of that secret sauce. I have an issue with that. I don't want to do that. I want to give the information straight to the commission so that it stays within governmental hands. I don't want to have to give it to my, the entirety of my network of distributors. Even if I have the most solid uh, contract with them, someone will leak. Plus some of those importers that compete with them on certain markets. So that doesn't work for me. We hear that from, from lots of people. Uh, on the other hand, we have um, imp uh, importers, uh, traders, also customs representatives, typically SMEs, small companies, um, and they say, what is this? I have no idea how to calculate the carbon footprint. I have no idea. I read this annex that you sent me. What, I, I, just To me, this is cryptic. Uh, there's no way I can fill those annexes in a way that is going to be free of mistakes. Um, and that's the thing. Importers, either they're except if the idea is to be like Venezuela and to say you are going to import through one importer for the whole of Europe, as opposed to have uh, using your distribution network that you spend decades building. Uh, that's the, uh, uh, but it, it, there will be a large number of importers and they will be making mistakes. That's for sure, they will be making mistakes. And, um, and so that is the thing that I've seen in my, in my practice. When you have, uh, you require expertise, expertise from people who don't have it, people do make mistakes. And when those mistakes are connected with the collection of EU revenue, this is always bad news because there is an, the anti fraud office of the, of the EU. Uh, and there you said at the beginning, until CBAM, you didn't know, you didn't know Taxid. I know Taxid, I've with Taxid and Olaf um, uh, for, for, for 20 years. And that is always bad news. You have uh, someone who is two, two or three years after importation telling you, this is not how you should have done it. This is how you should have done it. And therefore, this reduced carbon emissions that you claim is not accurately done. And therefore you have to pay those CBAM certificates plus penalties. This is, to me, this is not a, a, an if, this is a when. This is going to happen. And so um, foreign producers and importers alike should treat this very seriously uh, and, and prepare um, like there's no tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, that, that's my message well, too. Thank you, Eve. I tell you, my son is a lawyer, so I, I, and I, I hang around with the law firm for a few years, so I, I know a little bit about, but I can, I want to reassure you, Anis, that we take them very seriously, and I know there's two people you don't mess around, is, is taxation and immigration, so we, we do take you seriously, Anis, please rest assured of that. The other thing that uh, I want to say is that in our own little uh, exercises, in my own little mind, kind of preparing or trying to put this together, I run into the problem that you know, we know who the producer is. We want to talk to the steel guys who go to Eurofair and 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 and, and, and the members of Eurofair or, or Send Bureau and the members of Send Bureau, etc. When you start talking about importers, frankly, we had we didn't quite know exactly who to go talk to, because it is in our case, it's just not the world that we have dealt with. So it's going to be a very interesting, it's, it's not going to be a new tax suit, but for us, but it's certainly going to be a new universe of, in some cases, they're big and they're concentrated, but in many cases, they're very small and dispersed. And it's, indeed, it's going to be an interesting thing. I'd like to, to pause for a moment before, again, there's a natural segue into the discussion in the next section, but 
I'd like to stop for a moment and ask uh, those on the uh, on, on the on in, in the room in the in the in the meeting to raise their hands and tell me if they want the floor to ask a question. There are a number of questions on 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 the uh, on the Q and A, but again, I would very much and and I think the panelists can see them, but I would very much prefer that for those that want to. Uh, uh, to ask questions, to ask them live in such a way that we do have the benefit all of hearing and, and seeing that interaction. So is there anyone in the uh, in the audience that'd like to raise their hand and their little like, electronic hand in this in this case and and uh, and raise a question or a, or, or a comment from what you have heard so far? And, and it's very sincere. I mean, it's an opportunity. We're not forcing anybody, but at the same time, we're uh, we're giving the opportunity, uh, Ioannis and 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 and, and uh, Aaron and Tim and Eve. You see some of the comments. There's a there's a one attendee that has asked for the floor, and I I have been uh, I have been remit because I didn't see it. So David Jenkins, okay, okay, he did not want he raised his hand, but they declined to be declined to be a, a panelist. So I'm not quite sure which one. Sarah. So Sarah, if you wish to uh, in, kind of introduce yourself uh, very quickly and, and then Peter Bocek. Peter Bocek I know is from uh, from CEFEC, but Sarah, if you want to, uh, Sarah, you are first. And if you want to introduce yourself very briefly and then, and then oh, Hydro, okay. Sorry, I should, have, I should have known. <laughs> um, so, hi, my name is Sarah Hay and I represent um, Norsk Hydro. Um, we're the largest aluminium company in, in Europe, as well as uh, one of the largest uh, aluminium companies in the world outside China. So, really, because of this, we're one of the uh, individual companies with the highest potential impact from CBAM. So, we, we've, of course, been very engaged uh, in the process. Uh, so far. And so at one point that I wanted to pick on really just to um, make a comment was uh, what Aaron touched upon in terms of the exemption for scrap inputs and um, based on the implementing a regulation draft. And a big concern for us is, is how that draft regulation counts emissions from remelted aluminium scrap in imported products. So the way the current methodology is, is set up makes it um, really impossible for CBAM to mirror the carbon cost of, of the EU uh, ETS when it comes to, to aluminium, because what the regulation suggests is that when calculating the embedded emissions from imported aluminium, all remelted scrap content is to be assi assigned zero embedded emissions. But this mixes up different types of scrap. So it, it mixes carbon intensive industrial process scrap um, with recycled products such as cans or window frames, you know, car parts, so post-consumer uh, scrap. And so the way the methodology is outlined now, it overlooks that under the EU ETS, EU aluminium producers create and, and pay for the emissions of, of all aluminium, including those from metal that becomes processed in industrial scrap. But based on the, the draft rules, you know, an aluminium producer outside of the EU can remelt their processed scrap to make a product and import it to Europe as a carbon free uh, product at no CBAM costs. So we see this as a really, really big loophole and uh, potential for, for massively greenwashing carbon intensive imported um, products. And, and we believe uh, very strongly that only aluminium based on remelted post-consumer scrap that's completed that full product life cycle should be assigned zero emissions. Um, and I see that uh, Mr. Uh, Falman is here here today from from UBA. And uh, when we read, read your uh, discussion note back in January, this is a point that you picked up. So it was it was very curious uh, for us to see that that didn't seem to be taken into account in the draft implementing re regulation, at least from how how we read it. Um, so I just wanted to expand on on that point that Aaron made. Thanks, Sarah. I, we, we, we did have, as I said to you, 
uh, one of the, the long evenings that this team, based on time differences, had was on Slack and quite a passionate trying to understand and actually making calls to a few friends that I'm sure you know quite well to better understand exactly. But let me go to Peter Bocek for, from, uh, from CEFIC. I, I'd like to take all three questions and then move on. So Peter, uh, Peter go ahead, please. Thank, thank you, Andre. <clears throat> Peter Bocek with the European Chemical Industry Federation here in Brussels. Um, my concern is also in, in Sarah's direction of the risk of circumvention. And I get questions from my members about the electricity um, emission inclusion. Isn't there a risk that, um, uh, that importers might bypass this or might, um, might um, uh, deviate from the reporting requirement by um, moving scope one emissions into scope two, also heat production related <coughs> emissions, uh, creating a separate entity maybe, um, moving the utilities set to that entity. So there is a fear that maybe there, are, there is a way of playing around with uh, with the indirect emissions. And I wonder whether you have an answer to that. The, that would be very interesting. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Peter. And uh, David, you last year. Uh, thanks all. I'm, I'm from Department of Energy Security and Net Zero uh, in the UK. Uh, that said, I'm here just out of interest and a uh, bit of an amateur in this space. So apologies if the question's a bit naive. Um, I was just wanted to pick up on all the points Aaron, I think, made, which is about sort of identifying synergies with other reporting approaches. Um, because when it comes to embodied emissions, which the CBAM is interested in, I'm aware that, you know, the, the sort of often the industry standard way of thinking about this is the, the environmental product declaration or uh, life cycle analysis. Um, so I suppose I'd naively hoped that there might be some way of, of ensuring compatibility with that sort of data, i.e. you might have businesses who have very several life cycle analyses, and they're now going to need to report again, uh, determine their embodied emissions in a new and novel way in order to feed into the, into the EU CBAM. So I was wondering on if you had any reflections on why that's not possible or whether that's something that's going to be under consideration in the uh, transition period. Johannes, you will be a very popular person, which without any doubt, but I don't want to shortchange the other uh, speakers as well, so you may please feel free to, to, to intervene. I mean, it, it, again, these tend to become a bilateral with the Commission, but uh, the broader panel and people have views. So, uh, Johannes, you go first, because I think that's the reality of what we are. Okay, thank you. Yes, I mean, I, I also I wanted to reflect a bit because, I mean, some of the points raised in any case uh, relate to the points of the next panel and I I, I, I know that uh, uh, Hubert Falman will also touch upon these issues in his presentation so uh, I mean I can I can give a brief, brief uh, reflection on this uh, uh, on, essentially on the issues of scrap and on the issue of, of, of circumvention I mean uh, I want uh, just to come back because both of these comments point to to the definitive period. I mean, the point to bring washing and you know, the, the fact that it will be circumvention. I mean, the, the point for the first two years is to set a set of rules that can be can be workable on the basis of what, what we have on where we stand at the moment in order to make the system of, of operational. Uh, uh, the, the, the fact that there may that there is a risk of a circumvention in the definitive period uh, there is always that risk, but a large part of that can be captured by, by verification as such, because by, by then there will be uh, verification. Uh, and when it comes to specific rules when it, uh, as regards uh, the, the treatment of scrap, um, well, I mean, uh, um, I'll probably, I mean, I think I'll probably let uh, Hub uh, Hubert Falman re react to this uh, because it's a bit more uh, of, of a technical point uh, uh, when it comes to, to the treatment. But I think this was uh, <clears throat> a choice that was made in terms of how, how to treat it. We will see whether it is possible to, uh, uh, to, to, to rethink of the rules when it comes to the, 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 the definitive period. Um, 
Well, yeah, sorry. Ahead, please, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, by all means, go ahead. No, and then and then uh, when it comes to alternative methods, uh, you uh, uh, the, the the rule there is that they uh, that they need to uh, to be such in order to uh, uh, to reach uh, a similar level of calculations uh, to the rules that we we lay out as well uh, in in our in our annexes. Uh, uh, so uh, um, when it, you you mentioned specifically on, on EPD, this is on EPDs, and this is something that. Uh, Okay, we we'll need to look into whether they can fall under the the, the point C of the of the uh, of the rules that can be uh, um, acceptable. But it is not something that I can I can reflect on uh, at the moment. I just Thanks, because uh, you already said, and would like to just make sure that this is going to. I assume that you'll be around, and if we continue the discussion uh, in the next panel, you'll also be able to intervene and, and add to that. Uh, sorry, there was somebody else who I'm interrupted. I apologize for that. Who was it? So I was just going to confirm. I was just talking about sort of beyond the 2026 implementation as well as the transition period there. Um, ah, okay. So your your point was whether we can allow flexibilities beyond 2020s. Well, well, beyond because flexibilities, in fact, stop after the first year of the transitional period anyway. Uh, there are no flexibilities for the alternative systems. Um, after the first year of uh, of the traditional period uh no the way in which we 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 are moving our thinking uh, at the moment is that there will be just one set of rules uh for the for the definitive that's that's for for the remaining of the traditional period and for the definitive period itself and that's that's the that's the the reason why the the traditional period itself was was uh, uh structured in such a way so that we can see what is out there, collect information, and then make sure that we introduce where possible uh, fine tuning in our own rules that will be applicable to everyone from, uh, from 2026, that can, uh, that can build a certain synergies in order to uh, relieve the, the, the burden from uh, applying just, just our rules. So that's, that's, the, that's the answer to that. Anyone else that want to, to react? or i don't know anybody wanted to to react to this or anything else or do we move on i had a well, quick question yeah. sorry aaron go ahead a very quick question uh, and it's actually directed to sarah i understand the uh the aluminum uh, uh industries promotion of the idea that you could have a, an assumption of zero embedded emissions in post-consumer scrap uh, but but actually, I don't understand it. <laughs> if if we assume that post-consumer scrap is made from original primary production in foreign locations, which never paid a, a carbon price, why does it make a difference to discriminate between post-consumer and pre-consumer scrap in your recommendations? Yeah, good question. And really, it relates to the mirroring of the EU ETS costs. That's really a key Um uh, angle here for for CBAM and and point and so under the EU ETS um, European producers do not pay carbon costs on end of life products so the post consumer uh, scrap whereas we do for the the process uh, scrap is part of how the aluminium supply chain is is set up that it, you know between twenty five to fifty percent of um, the primary aluminium becomes scrap in the process and is reused again um and emissions uh, connected to that we pay for under the eu ets but for post-consumer scrap we do not so we really feel that the the costs under cbam really need to mirror the eu ets on this aaron i don't know if you want to uh, your your mind works the same way that where we had the long discussion but my question would be but even if it's post-consumer they have been paid at some point it has been paid at some point. I don't know where it may be in five cycles ago, but somebody paid for the carbon in the EU at so some point where the other guys haven't. That, yeah, by the same point. principle that precursor materials under the CBAM are uh, assessed at their embedded emission value, even though you know that's not the case under the ETS. By that same principle, you would think that we would be talking about assessing uh, a, post-consumer scrap as a precursor, which has not paid a carbon price under the CBA, but just, you know, let it go. 
we'll, 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 we'll have a bilateral with you, Liv, and, and, and the rest of the Hydra team that we know well. Anyway, folks, let's move on. Uh, Hubert, you're next, and you can you can share the screen. I you have a number of, of slides. Yes. Yes, I do. And can somebody confirm that my screen is? It is. It is clear uh, and 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 a square, a circle in a square, or outside good. a square. Very good. Then, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to present you some of the details of the implementing act of course uh, i have only very limited time to speak about it and unfortunately i decided that the topic of scrap would uh, go too far um, i just can say that i worked on some calculating examples of some more complex installations and it turned out that the treatment of internal scrap uh, before it becomes post-consumer scrap is not as trivial as it seems and so uh, not having rules for dedicated scrap uh, issues uh, goes back to the to the attempts to have a simple system uh, for the beginning of the CBAM and um, the other thing I would add to that point is if scrap is not always zero rated then we would have to think about whether scrap should be included as a product in the CBAM in the Annex 1 scope. And then, of course, you have to prove whether it's a post-consumer scrap or not, or whether you have produced uh, new ingots and just uh, divided them in the middle and call them scrap from that moment on. So it will be really difficult. And for the moment, we try to go for a simple system. Having said that, let's go back into my presentation. The beginning has already been uh, mentioned by Yanis, so I will not uh, repeat it. Everybody is aware that we want to mirror the ETS as much as possible. Um, some words about the concept of embedded emissions. Of course, people tend to think of it as a kind of carbon footprint. This is true to some, uh, to some extent, but we also have to uh, see that only those parts of a carbon footprint that are covered by the EU ETS would also be covered by the embedded emissions. So for the moment, for example, transport is not yet in the ETS, so it's currently not yet part of the embedded emissions concept. So many people have seen already this uh, slide. I will just be brief here. If we look at an installation producing goods, it has some greenhouse gas emissions that come from the raw materials, from fuels, from the basically from the carbon that is contained in these materials of fuels and that are oxidized and then emitted as CO2 into the atmosphere. We call that the direct emissions of the installation. It gets a bit more complicated as soon as the installation produces more than one uh, good category because then you have to split the emissions into those that belong to the one good and those two that belong to the other good. ETS uh, experts know this goes into the direction of the splitting into sub-installations. We call it in the CBAM production processes, but basically it's the same as a sub-installation. The next element here is that most installations consume electricity. Electricity is often produced again from fuels, the associated emissions to the extent that the electricity is used in this installation. These are referred to as indirect emissions. Um, of course, we can also have the situation that the installation itself produces electricity. Well, then they monitor themselves the emissions, but still everything that is electricity going into the production process is considered indirect emissions. You could also say that electricity is a precursor for the production process here. Uh, speaking of precursors, well, the installation may use some precursors uh, for the production process. And if the precursors are considered relevant, if they are listed explicitly in the implementing act as being relevant, then the emissions related to the production of the precursor need to be taken into account as well. Um, so the difference between uh, the raw materials going into an installation and the precursor is in the raw material case, it's only the carbon 
physically contained in the material that is relevant for the emissions, while for the precursors, perhaps the carbon that was in another raw material or another, another fuel that was consumed in another installation, that is the, the carbon uh, rucksack, so to speak, that goes into the production. We have said uh, we have to have a cutoff uh, point somewhere to, to not go back in eternally. So we said that usually the, the raw materials and fuels don't have embedded emissions themselves. This is of course an approximation of reality only, but most of these really are not included in the EU ETS. So this gives us the boundaries for the system boundaries for the CBAM embedded emissions along the red lines here. Um, we also need some calculation. I just put it here on the screen. I don't uh, speak about it in detail. This is the formula for taking into account the precursors in the recursive manner. So the precursor of a precursor can also be relevant in some cases, uh, but um, you can ask me about it, but I don't have the time to speak about it here in detail. The second formula that I put here on the slide is a very famous one coming from the EU ETS for the free allocation rules. The basic background here is when you split the emission of an installation into these sub-installations or production processes, you need to achieve equal treatment between installations that, for example, produce first measurable heat in a boiler or in a CHP plant and then use the heat compared to installations that just take the fuel and uh, create the heat directly. Same is true for electricity. Electricity itself is a product. It can be produced within the installation. It can come from outside. It can, can come from within the production process and being exported. You need to treat all these situations equally. So in this case, if you have exports of electricity, you have to deduct it from the emissions that are attributed to a certain CBAM good. And the last important thing is the treatment of waste gases, famous case, the, the blast furnace and the electricity created from blast furnace gases. You need to have some rules how you treat them. We have chosen the way to completely reflect the rules from the EU ETS. Uh, this is a kind of a table of contents of the famous Annex 3 of the Implementing Act you will see a stepwise approach that is also more or less reflected in the structure of the annex. First, the operator of an installation needs to define the installation's boundaries, the production processes and production routes. I already said production process is more or less the same as a sub-installation in the EU ETS. Then you need to perform the monitoring. Uh, you should have uh, what we call a monitoring methodology documentation. Uh, insiders of the EU ETS will come, uh, immediately think this sounds like a monitoring plan. Well, it does. It's just not approved by a competent authority. Um, you need to monitor the direct emissions, the measurable heat and electricity and precursors. We have copied the rules from the MRR, the monitoring and reporting regulation, and the free allocation rules, the FAR to the extent possible, and a few elements are new. Then the next step is attributing emissions to the production process and thereafter to the goods, that's in section F of the uh, annex. And finally, the, uh, the famous uh, precursors have to be added or their embedded emissions need to be added. And then of course we have to rule that uh, primarily pre preliminary de default values can be used under certain conditions. Uh, regarding the monitoring approaches, I can be brief here again. Uh, readers of guidance document one of the Commission uh, for the Monitoring and Reporting Regulation will know the pictures, uh, will know uh, that the standard methodology for calculation is something that multiplies the amount of fuel or material with an emission factor, takes into account biomass, uh, zero rated provided it complies with the sustainability and greenhouse gas emission savings uh, rules from the renewables directive. The mass balance is used where you have several materials leaving the installation still containing carbon, like in the steel industry, in the uh, organic uh, chemical industry, and so on. 
And finally, you have the possibility to do continuous emission monitoring where you really measure in the stack the concentration and the flow of the greenhouse gas, which is of course very demanding. So people try to avoid it, at least in Europe, um, but um, it can be done. And for N2O emissions, it's even mandatory to do this. I've not put on the slide the special rules for the PFCs and the aluminum industries, and we don't have any fallback approach like in the MRR because we have the wider flexibility possibilities. Uh, on the alternative possibilities, Yanis has already spoken, so I skip that. Uh, furthermore, regarding flexibility and simplification, well, we tried to reflect the EU ETS rules in very much detail, so you can really compare Annex 3 with the MRR and you will find most of the elements there, but what you will not find is the tier system. We know from international discussions that tiers are seen as something complicated, although in fact it was meant as a cost containment measure when they were introduced in the EU ETS, but still we have not introduced them here in the CBAM, but we have two definitions. We have the minimum requirements, which are really considered, this is necessary to comply with the CBAM regulation. And then we have something we call the recommended improvements. You could also read that as best practice that gives in several points in the annex, it shows you what should be the, the recommended improvements. That's more or less the highest tiers in the EU ETS. That's the best practice that you can apply to reach a good um, monitoring result. And then we have in uh, section H of the annex three, some uh, QA, QC, uh, methods that follow more or less the MRR uh, regarding data flow and control activities. Uh, it's a very short version and it's completely voluntary. But uh, as um, I think Eve before said that many uh, people have concerns that they will make mistakes. Well, if they are reasonable, they will look into that section H and will try to set up such a control system and will try to in, ensure that they have always a, a applied a 4i principle so that always at least two people look at data. They will compare a time series, they will compare different data sources in order to see what is the most appropriate, most accurate data that they have. And of course, uh, they can voluntarily always use verification. And that's of course the really a gold standard to achieve good data quality and nobody can uh, prevent an operator to do that already in the uh, preliminary, uh, in the transitional phase. Um, regarding dividing the installation into production processes, just very briefly, the default case is that uh, you have one production process per one aggregated goods category. Aggregated goods categories is something we invented to make the whole list of CN codes more tangible uh, to keep it uh, shorter uh, and to keep the monitoring system simpler. It's a little bit like one benchmark, one sub installation in the EU ETS. Voluntarily, of course, an operator can split production processes further if they want, for example, for different production routes like blast furnace and electric arc furnace in the same installation. They can also have more precise differentiation of products if they want, or if it's needed for their own uh, MRV system in their country. And um, uh, we already, uh, Aaron already mentioned it, uh, the bubble approach is meant as a strong simplification as I will show in the next slide uh, for um, avoiding additional monitoring burden. Um, so the example given uh, is uh, surprisingly the same as in your report that you showed. You have a sinter plant in, an, in the steel industry, you have a blast furnace, you have a steel making, a converter, and then several downstream processes, cold rolling, hot rolling, a rail mill. Um, then you assign the product goods categories, other uh, the CBAM goods categories, Sintered or pig iron, crude steel, and all the iron and steel products. So in this case, you would have to assign four production processes here, 
and monitor all the boundaries between all the material flows and heat flows between these uh, production processes. And of course, don't forget, there is a fifth production process, the power plant that uses the waste gas and produces electricity, which you then need for monitoring of indirect emissions. Um, but of course, with the said bubble approach, it is simpler, you would have to monitor only the iron and steel products and in the bubble, all the materials and fuels that go into the bubble and out of the bubble, which is allowed only if you don't sell intermediate products, because then you would have to determine the intermediate products embedded emissions. And then of course you need the added data. And of course, in this case, electricity stays in its own production process. I've been asked, or we have been asked in the chat already about the relevant precursors. So this is the very short overview, which precursors are relevant for which uh, CBAM goods category. So the numbers here for the precursors re uh, reflect the numbers here in the table. Please note the important element is that some goods categories can be their own precursor. So if, for example, you have uh, iron and steel uh, uh, flat uh, um, um, sheet. Uh, this is an iron and steel good. And if you produce profiles out of this uh, sheet, then the profile again is an iron and steel product, but a different one. And perhaps you have cut away a part of the steel and this is scrap that may go back into the process, but still, uh, so, so the precursor, you, you need more tons of precursor than the final product because some scrap is left. You need to take that into account in the calculation, but basically one good category has been the precursor of the other one. Uh, this must, may sound more complicated than it is in the, in the end, and we are working on guidance documents that explain that in more detail. Last slide regarding the reporting. So we do not have an annual emission report like in an ETS, but we have a communication that the operator should compile ideally three months after the end of the reporting period. Reporting period also has some flexibilities and they should compile this communication so that they can send it to each importer they need. So every importer can ask them and they would, will just pick it out from their emails and send the same email again to the next importer. Uh, it's very, 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 very much recommended that operators use the template that the commission will shortly provide on that. And we are working on that. It will look like the templates that you know from the EU ETS. It will also have similar um, functionalities that guide the user through the use of the template. And the, the most important thing is if the template is used, every user of the template will know where to find what information in the template and where to find the information, even if it's perhaps in a different language. And that's, I think this is really the killer argument for encouraging everybody to use that template. If there are confidentiality concerns, we are thinking of a version where the operator can pick out only the last sheet uh, that is really the information that the importers need and the rest of the information would be kept until somebody uh, competent asks them to uh, show the information. So if there are doubts, if there are court cases going on, verifiers of course would have to look at the whole data in the definitive phase. But for the moment we, we think we can we can alleviate the, the confidentiality concerns here. I mentioned here also in the slide that voluntary verification can be used and in if then the results should be communicated to the importers too. And uh, last uh, issue here, the Annex 4 legally provides the, the, the legal basis for the content of the Excel template with the minimum requirements with some optimal optional information and the famous sector specific qualifying parameters that are needed for getting some confidence in the data and some plausibility checks on the side of the commission and the competent authorities here in Europe. That's it, thank you for your attention and back to Andrea, I suppose.
Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Hubert. Uh, I think there will be a lot of questions on this. Emmanuel, why don't we move on to you? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Andre, and uh, good afternoon to, to everybody. So my name is uh, Emmanuel Bruta. I'm Public Affairs Director with SEM Bureau, which is the Association of the European Cement Industry. And um, and straight ahead, actually, I should say that, uh, of course, our, our members are predominantly uh, EU cement companies, uh, but a lot of these companies will also be subject to reporting requirements of CBAM because, in fact, the countries um, importing cement into the EU are, are predominantly Turkey, the Maghreb country, some Eastern countries where European companies are, are widely present. So our members will, will also be covered by, by the reporting uh, obligations. The other thing which I will stress is um, SEM Bureau's membership also stretches to the UK, Switzerland, Norway, and we have a partnership agreement with Ukraine as well. And so for us throughout the CBAM discussion, it was very important that indeed CBAM is not a protectionist tool, but is a fair uh, a tool to, to avoid carbon leakage in, uh, in the EU. And, and from this point of view, I think, um, you know, the colleagues from Digitaxid and the co-legislators have done a very good job. It is a fair system. Um, uh, it is. It, it, it absolutely aims to 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 equalize carbon costs between EU and non-EU suppliers, but it is definitely definitely not a protectionist tool, and and, and I think that's very very important. Now, um, to, to, just to highlight from the bureau, so why, why did we support CBAM in the first place? So when you look at EU cement um, imports, and and you have the latest statistics actually on on Stem bureau's website. Uh, we moved basically from, from 2.5 million tons a year of, um, of cement imports in 2016 to about 10 million tons a year uh, last year. So we've seen a, a fourfold increase of, uh, of our imports and all of this you know, happening on the back of the high carbon price. So I think we, we know at least with cement what, what carbon leakage looks like. And, and for us and, and also for, for European cement companies, it was really important to, to have CBAM to have these guarantees that you know whatever efforts is deployed by the European industry, we will not be undercut by uh, cheaper imports, which would not pay any uh, CO2 rights. Um, and from this perspective, you know, I can I can tell you that we've uh, recently met um, uh, uh, with our companies during the SEM Bureau uh, General Assembly. And it was very clear that um, firstly there are quite a lot of green investments happening in the EU cement industry. And for all these investment decisions, actually CBAM plays a, a major role. So I just wanted to say it's very important, you know, not only for, for imported into the EU, but also for EU companies actually to have a CBAM, which is uh, working well and, and being fully operational. So that's why for us, um, uh, in fact, having a fully watertight CBAM is important. And, and this takes me to the implementing act, uh, the draft implementing act where I would echo what um, the other speakers have, have said and, and um, you know, mini Michael, Andre and Aaron, I think, I think the European Commission did a, a good job indeed in terms of, um, of mirroring the, uh, the EU ETS. This is also something that, that Hubert uh, explained very well. Uh, and from this perspective, we, we, we think, you know, the text is, is quite good. We do have some recommendations to further improve it, but broadly we think it's a, it's a very good uh, draft document. Something which was a bit uh, more contentious for us was the issue of flexibilities. I think we understand uh, why the Commission is proposing this, and we acknowledge that it will take some time to, to you know, fully apply the, the Annex 1 requirement. Uh, what's important for us is, of course, that, you know, those flexibilities are, are strictly limited in time, which I think is the, is the intention from, from what I heard from, from Yanis today. So that's good. Um, on this, I mean, this leads me to another topic, I and mean, we've heard uh, a bit in this meeting, but also outside of this meeting, many complaints from importers who qualify CBAM to be to be a burden, who say, uh, "Oh, now we will need to to monitor CO two emissions." And I do agree that it will be a border, uh, a burden for for importers, uh, and I do agree that the Commission and and national authorities should do you know their best to to facilitate the, the job of, of importers. But at the same time, to be honest with you, you know, we're in 2023, we're faced with a climate emergency, and I don't really understand why somebody would produce cement anywhere in the world without measuring the CO2 content. Um, I'm sorry to just say it like this, but we're talking, you know, with cement, steel, fertilizers, we, we, we're talking about very, very CO2 intensive commodities. I mean, I mean, for cement, you know, we're talking about between 500 kilograms and 800 kilograms per, per, of CO2 per, per ton of cement. So. 
I think, yeah, eventually we need to get there. And, and, and those countries which do not measure the CO2, okay, they will have to do it. I, I get it. It's a new thing, but it's also something which we need to do if we want to meet our, our collective climate ambition. So, uh, you know, again, I, I fully understand it's a new system. I, 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 you know, I get that the ETS requirements are, are quite demanding, but at the same time, I, I really think we, 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 we need to get there and we, and we have to move there. And then in the case of cement, uh, ju just to explain, I mean, in the case of cement, um, the, in fact, to be a member of the Global Cement and Concrete Association, GCCA, cement companies are, have been required for many years already to report about their CO2 emissions. So actually, you know, most of the cement companies around the world are already doing this today. We have ISO standards on measuring uh, uh, CO2 emissions in, in cement, which are also applicable. So it's not really something new. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, I just wanted to say, certainly in the case of cement, I think, you, you know, again, I get I get this idea that CBAM is going to bring some requirements, it's going to be burdensome, I'm, I'm not disputing it, but we're not talking about something completely new, uh, at least certainly not in, in the case of, um, of cement. And then the, the last thing which I which I wanted to um, uh, actually was, was uh, just to bounce back on, I think it was Aaron's last slide, where Aaron, you, you suggested that yeah, at some point we could move towards greater convergence between the uh, ETS reporting mechanism and, and and you know other mechanisms around the world. I I would agree um, to this, but at the same time, I think it's very important to preserve the environmental integrity of you know of what we're doing. So I'm going to take a very concrete example. Um, one way um, EU cement companies may reduce their CO2 emissions today is to phase out fossil fuel that, that we use in cement kilns and, and instead uh, use biomass waste, for instance. Now, EU rules set very strict requirements on the type of biomass we, we can use. And I think that's, you know, that's fair play because you shouldn't start, you know, burning primary forests to, to reduce your CO2 emissions. Now, you know, these type of detailed rules, they are actually part of the of the CBAM implementing act. And I think it's a very good thing that, that they're there. So, you know, again, I do agree on, on you know, the, the greater convergence, but, but, but I think it would be hard to know exactly where, you know, where do we, do we set the barrier and, and, you know, where do we achieve something which, which does not question the environmental integrity of CBAM. So, so yeah, to, uh, I just wanted to leave you with this thought, but, but again, I, I agree with the, with the general comment, Aaron, and that, that's it for me, uh, Andre. Thanks a lot. Thanks, uh, thanks, and I'm quite passionate. Uh, now, Mr. An uh, from POSCO, I, re I understand that you're having problems with your with your uh, video, but are you there? Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Yes, we can hear you. We we cannot see you, but we can hear you. So, if you just introduce yourself a little bit, so people understand more a little bit of the uh, some of the activities you're involved in. Yeah, people spoke, speaking, so I'm so I'm sorry, so I cannot manage the videos on my uh, iTap. Anyways, uh, my name is uh, uh, Yungi, and the last name is Ang. Um, I, I working for the Posco Research Institute. So, mother companies, Posco, you, you know these two companies. Anyways, thank you for inviting me to today's event. Anyways, I uh, today's uh, I I have a concern about uh, uh, monitoring and uh, reporting uh, uh, for the CBAM, especially uh, just to uh, present, present, present the embedded, em, embedded emissions measuring. I, I think it's embedded measuring is, is not, well, uh, it, it is okay or not for the uh, products. So, Anyway, so today I will talk about uh, uh, rather rather than in monitoring um, uh, monitoring reporting, uh, I would like to focus on the verifications. Uh, you know, it's with the with the spread of ETS ring to the CBAM and uh, the low carbon green finance. Carbon pricing is the full uh, swing for products uh, including process. In particular, Carbon price uh, of, of volatility, volatility will increase due to the demand for the greenhouse gas, uh, gas calculation uh, throughout. I mean, the, uh, for the scarcity, the entire product process. But the carbon, uh, carbon pricing is uh, expected to continue. Uh, I mean, the, uh, in other words, uh, current carbon pricing is the beginning stage by uh, policy and regulation. 
Uh, therefore, in uh, in order to revitalize uh, the trade and the market of the products based on the carbon price, it is most important to have a public uh, confidence in verification based on the uh, calculation and the reporting of, of carbon emission of products. Accordingly, the Korean government, uh, uh, exactly the Ministry of Industry, began to overhaul the com conformity, conformity assessment scheme for verifying uh, verifying the greenhouse gas emission in uh, from 2020, and uh, laid the institutional foundation on January 17, 2023. Uh, as you all know, so according to the rule of the WTO, ISO, et cetera, the conformance assessment schemes uh, should uh, consist of uh, three, three parties, uh, 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 recognition, uh, recognition agents and uh, the certification agents and uh, a training institution. And uh, pretty probably it's, uh, Recognition agency was uh, judged the one country and one system is uh, is good uh, should be appropriate. Uh, according to uh, as of January 17, 2023, the Korean government uh, has uh, established the component assessment scheme with the uh, Korean Institute of Technology and the Standard under the Ministry of Industry as of uh, accredited. Uh, accredited uh, institution. And now it is necessary to sign a mutual recognition agreement between the trading partner to revitalize uh, uh, international trade based on the ETS linked carbon uh, CBAN. Uh, there must also be international standard for the measurement uh, reporting and uh, analysis of greenhouse gases. The G7 ministerial meetings of uh, April 27, uh, to, uh, 27 this year agreed to develop the international standard. However, the steel industry is uh, uh, representative of targets to uh, industry for the standard developments. As far as I know, ISO has international standards for the measurement and the reporting from the perspective of the entire product process aimed at the carbon neutrality in the case of, of the steel industry and the international standard for the certification. In particularly, it already has the green taxonomy, green taxonomy international standard, which will act as an investment standard for the capital market. In addition, it also has a, a consultative body called the I, IAF, International Accreditation Forum, which oversees the global conformity assessment scheme. Accordingly, the Korean steel industry, including PASCO, is considering me, uh, measuring and reporting greenhouse gases in accordance with the ISO international standard, including uh, low carbon standard and a couple Conformity assessment scheme will be in will be in, in place. Therefore, I hope that countries such as the EU, Korea, and Japan, and etc., will agree on the unified international standard for measuring and uh, reporting greenhouse gases and uh, proceed with it, the consultation on the mutual recognition uh, between the uh, recognized institu institution as soon as possible. In particular, uh, finally, so I'd like to say that the avoided emissions for the product is very important for the uh, CBAM. So in the future, so, uh, EU ETS CBAM consider, uh, will consider the uh, avoided emission. Thank you. Thank you very much for your intervention. Let me, so we can have time for a bit of a discussion. Daniele, uh, you you're next to bat here, so uh, I think you've been very patient waiting. Appreciate appreciate the patience. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Andre. Uh, it was very interesting to, to follow all this uh, conversation. And uh, let me start from one uh, key point. So we are fully aware 
that uh, CBAM is a key mechanism for, for European Union, for European Commission, and for the implementation of the EU Green Deal. At the same time, this key tool will be implemented mainly outside Europe. It is a very important concept because uh, we just uh, have the, the, the intervention of the colleagues uh, uh, POSCO uh, underlined some uh, criticism, but uh, was also some uh, reference to ISO standard from him and from Emmanuel at the same time. And I'd like to have a short introduction of the ISO package because if we are thinking of an international implementation of a European tool, we need to think also of the international standard already available because ISO is a full package for monitoring, reporting, verification, and accreditation. I don't want to be, I don't want to be too long, but uh, we have the first set of carbon accounting standard for organization, for project, for products. I avoided to mention the numbers here, not to be too boring, but uh, this is all this, the full set of accounting standard. It's very interesting that uh, the CBAM is starting from the UETS experience, it's per definition is an experience at the organizational level, but at the end of the story, the result will be represented at the product level. So there is some kind of mix of approach. We have scope one and scope two. With the precursor, we have a kind of approach for scope three, but at the end, when you report all the results at the product level, there is an, another very important key concept in ISO 14067, that is the allocation. But uh, I want to focus my intervention more in the area of the conformity assessment, where we are still have some space for development uh, uh, of the rules. Um, we have uh, two main references here. The 14,064 part three, and this is a specific standard to perform verification and validation. And we have the 14,065, that is the standard for the accreditation of the verification body. And it is important to, uh, to clarify the meaning of accreditation because accreditation is an attestation performed by a national accreditation body that a specific conformity assessment body meets the requirement of harmonized standard, et cetera. No? So it's a confirmation of the capacity to manage the competencies, independency, impartiality, et cetera. It's also interesting that uh, on the base of the EU regulation 765, each EU member states needs to have a single accreditation body. So here are some examples. And all this accreditation body at the European level works together under the coordination of the European Cooperation for Accreditation. And this is very important because this allows to have the peer evaluation, the cross control between different countries to increase the level of consistency, the harmonization of the approach. And on the base of this peer evaluation, the national accreditation body operating within EA are able to sign the multilateral agreement. A multilateral agreement is fundamental. It means that if a verification body in Italy perform a verification of a single company, then this single verification is recognized in Germany, in France, or in uh, other European countries. But it's also important to think, as mentioned before by uh, the colleagues of POSCO, that there are not only the European Cooperation for Accreditation at European level, there are other regional uh, um, uh, association of accreditation body, like uh, IASC in America, PAC in the Pacific area, etc. And all of them, are part of the IAF, International Accreditation Forum. And even at this level, it's possible to sign a multilateral agreement. So the idea to have a full recognition at the international level of a single verification body is already on place. It is already on place in addition with another standard. Now, I don't want to complicate too, too, too much the situation, but there is a, a new standard for all the verification and the validation activities for this accreditation. But it's interesting, I think, to have a look to this uh, diagram. Here we have a 7229, it's applicable to all verification and validation. But when we move in direction of greenhouse gas, we enter in this area. And in this area, we have the standard for accreditation and we have the standard for the process requirement for verification and validation. And then we have the accounting standard here at the lower level. It is very interesting to note here that, for example, we have 
one area that is for the full voluntary standard, one area that is for another particular standard that I'll mention later, and one area is for the mandatory standard, regulated standard. So I want to go in particular to, to these specific aspects. As I mentioned before, all over the world, there are several thousand of greenhouse gas statements already verified in the product organization, in the project sector, and uh, in different countries, all the way using 4065 and 4064 part three. But there are even an important private international scheme like uh, Cao Corsia, que is very well known, that is applicable to all international flight operators. And even this case, ICAO Corsia is using 4065 in conjunction with 4064 part three. And even the mandatory scheme, we have the implementation of this standard. For example, UTS, the key mechanism, the key system that is at the center of discussion today is using a verification approach on based on 4064 part three, that is obviously described in AVR, in the regulation AVR, but is based fully on 4064 part three and under the accreditation of 4065. There is another important regulation, MRV shipping, even in this case, accreditation according to 4065. Only to say that the, this package of standard is fully recognized in the voluntary, in the private, uh, sector and the public at the public level sector. One uh, consideration I think is important in the, um, the, the regulation 765 that is regulating the rules for the accreditation body uh, required the attestation by national accreditation body that the conformity assessment body meets the requirement. Oh, sorry for that. Body meets the requirement. And the point that is in this moment that the CBAM is clarified that any person may be accredited. So this is an inconsistency according to the European uh, uh, rules. So maybe we think that this is something that should be in some way corrected because it's not really uh, inconsistent with the international rules for the accreditation. So um, let me say some conclusion. Um, the example of the impossibility to have a single person accredited as described in this moment in CBAM is an evidence that uh, to have the re-elaboration of the already existing international standard implies always a risk, a risk to have a mistake. So personally, I think that the most uh, easy way is try to use as much as possible direct reference to the ISO standard that are largely implemented at the international level. And uh, there is also the risk to, to not, um, there is no add value to have any duplication of MRVA activity. I have to say that the flexible approach is very welcome because the flexible approach allow the possibility of an implementation of ISO standard in combination in direction to satisfy the CBAM. But only to conclude, I think that at the moment, the idea is that all the verification of CBAM will be performed by a verification body accredited under the UTS approach by the European accreditation body. This implies that only the European verifiers will be responsible to perform all the verification for the CBAM, uh, at least as it's, it's written this moment. And I think that is really a big challenge because uh, even to fulfill the activity for UTS is a big challenge for the verification body in Europe. And to have an additional load of CBAM, I think will be create some important crisis to, to, to the system. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very, okay, sorry, okay, there you go. Okay, thank you, Daniele. Uh, we, as always, have been greedy and have uh, kind of maybe taken advantage of such interesting speaker and maybe crammed a little bit too much in this, but at least we're, we're, we're ready to, to, to stay on for a few more minutes if any questions are, uh, are emerging on the on the screen. So again, I'm urging people to raise their, their hands if there's anybody that would like to ask a question or any of the 
attendees that would like to react to uh, some of the presentation that we have now from Hubert and Emmanuel and Mr. Ahn and, and Daniela. So uh, if you, you have your hand up, you, you go ahead, please. Thanks, Andre. This is to answer uh, Levin Stallman's uh, question in the chat. I just did it in writing, but I wanted to clarify my point. Mm -hmm. So what we hear from manufacturers, the reluctance to share information is, of course, not to share information about the embedded emissions in whatever they sell. It's to share the information as to how they calculated that. Because the greenest manufacturers, uh, they spend lots of money to manufacture in the greenest way, and they are very reluctant to disclose anything which would help their competitors understand how they do it. And so that is the reluctance and hence the request to be allowed to feed information directly into the CBAM registry as opposed to having to submit the information through a large uh, number of importers. So that, that was my point. Yeah, uh, thanks. I, I saw the question. Uh, yeah, there are a couple of other questions, but again, I'm encouraging people for some strange reason, people are reluctant to raise their, their, their hands and speak up. Uh, David, you had the you want to come back? Uh, hi there. I, I'm happy for that. Mine's a separate question, so I'm happy for that one to go to go first. If somebody wants to jump in on that, well, why don't you go? Like, let's keep it short because I think we're at the end of the of time, sure. and, and I think people will start going to other commitments. Sure. I mean, okay, I just wanted to um, dig into something Emmanuel mentioned. I suppose also crossing over with something Danielle was talking. Talking about, um, he mentioned, sorry, a bit of background noise, but I'm, I'm with you. Um, he mentioned how you know all companies really ought to be reporting and measuring their emissions, uh, which um, I, of course, agree with. But I suppose a concern raised by the the approach of the EU CBAM is that it has a quite idiosyncratic focus from the perspective of um, other countries with its focus on the ETS scope. So, you know, potentially a business abroad will be doing thorough uh, embodied emissions assessments in the form of EPDs, uh, which will have a wider scope than uh, that which is considered by ETS, for, ETS and EUC BAM reporting. And basically worried about the extent to which um, duplication of measuring reporting, uh, you know, verification will be required in order to cooperate with the EUC BAM requirements. So I was just wondering if you had any, any thoughts on that, you know, uh, or whether, you know. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Again, it's it's remarkable that quite a few people beating the odds or the percentages have stayed on. In you know, it, it used to be like this in ETS, it's in CBAM now. Uh, anyone else that want to to comment, react, or otherwise have his piece? If there's no one, I'll ask my, if my, my colleagues want to add anything to this at the end, it's, you know, beyond the fact that it's been a heck of a rich thing and will will get us to think about many of these things in, in quite detail, probably go back to some, you know, uh, go back to some of you and maybe, maybe uh, kind of revisit some of the things that you've said. But for the moment, Aaron, Michael, Sarah, Aaron, nothing from me. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm muting myself to say I have nothing to say. <laughs> Good. Sorry okay. life. Uh, Andre, I'm, I'm also, I mean, I'm, I'm curious if any of the panelists want to answer to David, but if, if I should preface maybe by time to think, um, my takeaway, and of course, I mean, this is a consultation period, it's a draft, so I guess we will see changes, and I think there's been feedback, both encouraging, but some also critical. And I think Ioannis and Hubert also acknowledge that, you know, this feedback will be taken into account. So we have to see what comes out at the end. And this is only transitional period. The really serious, let's say, rules follow in, in for 2026. And Daniele already wisely was sort of focusing in on the accreditation and the verification part, not even what's now in the current implementing regulation for the transitional period. I still wonder how we're going to escape that tension between trying to align it as much as possible with the EUTS and make sure that it's a level playing field to you know, protect, to, to really offer the, the justified protection for European industry, while at the same time making it flexible and making it sort of more comparable with international standards. There is no simple 
formula to, to reconcile those two goals. Um, and so I guess, you know, that's going to be one of the frontiers where we will continue having discussions. And I'm interested and curious and hopeful that we can make progress on that. But it's definitely been a very interesting discussion. Thank you. Well, my role is to thank you all. Uh, I think that we stand by what we said. It's uh, there is no work of perfection, and uh, what the what the Digitaxu, the Commission has put forward, has raised a number of questions. I think we've raised them in our paper. Some of you have raised it. I'm sure that Johannes and colleagues will. Uh, will react to uh, uh, to this in their de domestic deliberations. Uh, but on, on, on balance, I think that it provides a level of recognition of the fact that this is new and may sound bizarre to some people that some guy that makes steel or, or, or whatever he makes somewhere else, something in some faraway land, and, and all of a sudden his face with this stuff. And I think we have to make to make uh, to provide space for that. Uh, it doesn't mean that we have to be soft or that we have to allow for uh, uh, people to get away. We think they shouldn't be getting away, but I think that there is a balance. And at least on the surface of it, with the caveats of what we discussed here today, crap and everything else, uh, I think it's a good balance. Uh, we look forward very much to receiving the uh, the, the final output of this this work. Uh, it will be uh, probably at the time when many of you will start drifting away in summer. So uh, again, thank you all very much for, for taking the time here today. I think that we have been very ambitious and I think we have something else that is coming on CCS or something July 20th. So all of my colleagues have been very ambitious and I, I hope there's somebody left in Brussels at that time. But with, if we don't see you, you know, thank you very much and have a nice summer. You have seen our program for the fall, it's full, and hope to see you there as well, and hope that you find some value in, in what we do. So I appreciate your, your attendance here today. Thank you very much. Have a nice summer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Bye bye.